Thank you, choir. I love the great hymns of the church. Thank you so much. Come and worship. Trust in the one who co-creates the was, the now, and the will be. Our hope is in the one who creates expansive love, calling us to do the same. Follow the one who never breaks covenant. We follow the one whose extravagant love calls us to co-create justice for the oppressed, the hungry, unlocked prisons, and welcome strangers for Praise the one whose justice is graceful and inclusive. We praise the spirit that spans the ages. Amen. Our first hymn is number 66. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. Stand as you are able. join together in our unison prayer saying God help us to change to change ourselves and to change our world to know the need of it to deal with the pain of it to feel the joy of it to undertake the journey without understanding the destination to learn the art of gentle revolution Amen
As we continue to worship, let us move to a time of prayer. We'll begin that at a time of silence. Move to pastoral prayer and then join together in the Lord's Prayer. Lord, if I've heard it once, I must have heard it a hundred times. I knew it was coming, but when it happened, I just wasn't prepared for it. They mean death, the people who said it. And when it happened to someone close to me, I wasn't prepared for it either. But if we weren't, aren't prepared for that, how much more of a shock and surprise must the resurrection be? except that we've domesticated it so. We've clearly kept it as a part of the great story, but have lost the shock of it, felt by the disciples and Mary Magdalene and even Thomas. Oh God, shed the blindness of our familiarity of it so we can begin to understand, to catch a glimpse to feel the unexpectedness, fear, and joy of what the resurrection of Jesus is and means for the world and for us. This would be our prayer this morning. I don't know how that happens for a people who trust in Jesus and his resurrection. It's just that the whole thing seems so normal to us, but it's not. So thank you for the resurrection and the hope that one day after we have died, we too will rise because Jesus has gone before. And may we never take it as a matter of course or just the way it is. Because you have changed everything through Jesus, including and especially us. And don't ever let us be so cavalier as to think, and that's the way it is. Maybe that's why we say change is hard, and at least one gospel writer notes that there was trembling and shaking as they left the tomb. Raise us up, O Lord, to new life in Christ, and to love and to serve and to change the world as we have been changed. Amen. It's so good to be with you this morning. You're a generous congregation. And I have some exciting news to share with you about that generosity. You remember a few weeks ago, a call went out for cookies for the Kairos prison ministry. Well, does anybody have a guess how many dozen were baked and given? Any, any guesses? How about 94 dozen? 94 dozen. That's a lot of cookies, yeah. And just think of all of the smiling faces that could be seen as those cookies were presented. It was a gracious thing to do, and I'm sure it meant so much to so many. And we're thankful for Jer to Jerry Burns for, for that report. 
It was a wonderful report. I'm going to ask Marsha Marsh to come up. She has just a word of request for you. Good morning, beloved of God, and those of you who are here and the millions watching on OLN. Um, I am standing before you because I need help, please. Um, yeah. I'm sort of kind of running with Barbara's help, the um, altar committee. We have very few people who have raised their hand and said, ooh, I'll help. It's really fun. And if there's anything in you that says, I could do that one Saturday a month, please step forward and let me know. Let the office know. It's, we have a good time when we do it. And, and it really doesn't take much of your time. On a Sunday morning, taking this down takes less than 15 minutes. To put it up is usually less than a half an hour. So pray on it, think on it. Man or woman, because we need some tall people. Um, if you can help with the altar, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. And I would just ask that you peruse the, the back of your bulletin for uh, continued needs and also for all of the events that are happening here during the week. We give thanks to God for all of the opportunities to serve him. And let us now continue our worship with the presentation of our offerings.
O Lord, you shower your blessings upon us daily, and you call us, call us to serve through our gifts, our presence, our prayers. And what a privilege it is, O Lord, to serve with you and to feel your strengthening presence. Amen. I really hate to interrupt this ministry of music with a sermon, but I know that that's what you're expecting me to do, so you've persuaded me. I, I will preach a sermon today. And it's based on a passage from the Gospel of John, the 20th chapter. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. 
The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In our scripture reading today, John wants to make sure that we understand the emotional and mental status of the disciples. So he gives us some important details that not only was the door of the room where they were gathered shut, but locked. He's telling us with that detail that the disciples were very fearful, scared of the threats on the other side of that door. Fear can be so paralyzing. Thoughts of what may lurk on the other side of a door can bind us and keep us from moving forward. Like the five-year-old boy who was in the kitchen as his mother made supper. She asked him to go into the pantry and get her a can of tomato soup. But he didn't want to go alone. It's dark in there and I'm scared, he said. She asked again and he persisted. Finally, she said, okay, it's okay. Jesus will be in there with you. Well, Johnny walked hesitantly to the door and slowly opened the door and he took just a peek inside. But, you know, it was dark. It was dark. And an idea came to him and just as he was about to leave and turn away from the door, that idea came in full bloom and he said, Jesus, if you're in there, would you hand me that can of tomato soup? <laughs> oh, his mother reflected. Mothers can be very wise, you know. And then an idea came to her. And she said, here, take my hand. I will be Jesus' hands today and go in with you. But you have to open the door and you have to get the soup. Well, Jesus' tomb is open and it's empty, but the disciples' house is closed and the doors are locked tight. Kind of an irony, isn't it? The house had become their tomb. Jesus is on the loose and the disciples are bound with fear. Oh, fear can exist on either side of a door, from the inside, but also from the outside. Philip Yancey, in his book, Finding God in Unexpected, Unexpected Places, writes about this very dynamic of fear, either behind a door or outside a door. He writes, on a trip to South Africa, I met a remarkable woman named Joanna. She is of mixed race, part black and part white, a category known at the time as colored. As a student, she agitated for change in apartheid and then saw the miracle that no one had predicted, the peaceful dismantling of that 
evil system. But instead of just exulting in her newfound freedoms, Joanna next decided to tackle the most violent prison in South Africa, a prison where Nelson Mandela had spent several years. Tattoo-covered gang members controlled the prison, strictly enforcing a rule that required new members to earn their admittance to the gang by assaulting undesirable prisoners. And as prison authorities looked the other way, beatings and even murder prevailed. Alone, this attractive young woman, Joanna, courageously went through the door of that prison and through the doors that led into the most locked down, dangerous bowels of that prison. Isn't it a wonder that Joanna went through those doors? I've thought about that many times. Would I have been willing to go through? But she did, and she brought a simple message of forgiveness and reconciliation, trying to put into practice on a smaller scale what Mandela was doing throughout the nation. She organized small groups, taught trust games, got the prisoners to open up about their childhoods, which had been, in many cases, just awful, horrific childhoods. The year before she began her visits, the prison had recorded 279 acts of violence. The next year, there were two, two. Joanna's results were so impressive that the BBC sent a camera crew from London to produce two one-hour documentaries about Joanna. Well, Philip goes on to say in his story about Joanna how he met her. He met her and her husband who had joined him in this ministry, who had joined Joanna in the ministry. He met them at a restaurant on the waterfront of Cape Town. Ever the journalist, he said, I pressed her for specifics on what had happened to transform that prison. Her fork stopped on the way to her mouth and she looked up and said, almost without thinking, well, of course, Philip, God was already in that prison. I just had to make him visible. Well then, he goes on to say, I have often thought of that line from Joanna, which would make a fine mission statement for all of us seeking to know and follow God. God is already present in the most unexpected places. We just need to make God visible. Well, that is not always easy, is it? There are days when we prefer just to stay in bed, pull the covers over our head, and close out the world. It was probably a little bit harder for many of us to get up this morning because it wasn't a very cheerful morning to greet us. Some days it seems easier and safer to lock the doors of our house and avoid the circumstances and people around us. Sometimes we just want to hide and not deal with the reality of our lives and those around us. But thankfully, for most of us, that's not every day. But thank the Lord for people like Joanna and 
for people like you. In whose lives God becomes visible. Well, you may be saying to yourself right now, when did I do that? When did I make God visible? I don't remember that. But let me tell you, it happens. It's real. You make God visible. Some years ago, I went to visit one of our residents in the hospital. His name was Bob Brookie. And I can share this story because while well, he and his daughter wanted it to be shared. Bob was very ill. He was in ICU. And I'll never forget the day I went to his door, which was partially open in the ICU. And I could see him sitting on the edge of his bed, looking out the window. He wasn't moving and he looked deep very deep in thought. In fact, I waited a moment because it was one of those moments where I felt I would be interrupting a conversation, but there was no one that I could see. Oh, but he was having a conversation. But even after waiting a while, I, I felt it was time, so I finally knocked on the door. He turned his head to the door and said, Oh, pastor, come in. In fact, your timing is good because I was just having a conversation with someone we both talk about and know. Well, that got my attention right away. And I responded, well, clue me in. And he said, the Lord was having a conversation with me. And he said, do you remember that poem, Footprints in the Sand? And I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I keep it on my, my phone and I pull it out and read it, read it pretty regularly. He said, well, the Lord has been speaking to me about that poem. And just to refresh your memory, let me read just a portion of that to you. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with it, but it, it uh, goes like this. And it was first written by Mary Stevenson in 1939. And she writes, One night I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord. Many scenes from my life flashed across the sky. In each scene I noticed footprints in the sand. Sometimes there were two sets of footprints. Other times there were only one set of footprints. But I said to the Lord, you promised me that if I followed you, you would walk with me always. But I have noticed that during the most trying periods of my life, there have been only one set of footprints in the sand. Why, when I needed you most, have you not been there for me? Well, we know. That's when the Lord was carrying him. Well, Bob had a different version of that poem that came out of his conversation with the Lord. And he said, Pastor, in my version, there are footprints all over the beach. I mean, everywhere. Not just two sets or one set, but, but all over, all over the beach. And he said, yes, Lord, you carried me through these hard times, but you have enlisted those wonderful people at Otterbein to do the heavy lifting. Oh, I could have just melted right there on the spot. Think of that. Yes, in his conversation with the Lord, he was saying, yes, Lord, you carried me, but you enlisted those people 
to do the heavy lifting. Wow. You see, it was, it was wonderful to be there with Bob as he shared that. A hospital room, as we know, can be a dreary place. Sometimes it can feel like a prison. But here with Bob, the door was open, not just the door to his room, but the door to his heart and mind. And there was already a conversation going, and he was just gracious enough to include me in that conversation. And in that moment of sharing, God was visible to us. And you know what happens when God is made visible? We can't hold it in. You know, we just, we got to share it. So I, as I left Bob's room, after we had a word of prayer together, I went straight to my car and just straight back here to Otterbein as fast as I could legally go. And I went straight through the door here to the door to pay the payroll coordinator, who at that time was his daughter, Lynn. I had to tell Lynn about this. And she was so thrilled when I told her. And I, I will tell you, in her office that day, there, were, there was laughter, there were tears, and some hallelujahs. Well, some months later, her father, Bob, died. And at his memorial service in the bulletin, well, what would you guess was printed? Both versions of footprints, the original and Bob's. And I think we all like Bob's the best. It spoke to us. Yes, the community, people here had made God visible, visible to Bob. But there are so many ways that God becomes visible to us. I love it when the scriptures intersect our daily lives and in that intersection, God becomes visible. The scripture for this morning intersected with the experience of COVID for me. Oh, you remember all of that, don't you? We were all in lockdown mode. And like those disciples, we, we huddled behind closed doors, afraid of what was on the other side, of that which could threaten our wellness, our very lives. And we were so afraid of the breath of others that even when we went out, the barrier went with us in the mask, <laughs> the dreaded mask. Well, during that time when we were all behind those doors and behind the barriers of the mask and many other barriers, I received a request to start a grief support group. I wasn't sure how that would be possible, but it was made possible, but only if we met in the King Center and we spaced out and we wore masks. But we were there, we did it. And it was a small group, and I'll never forget one day, one of the members said, you know what has been so helpful to me is the breath prayer. And I hadn't heard about that before even though, as it turned out, after I did some investigating, it's been a part of the history of the church for many centuries. And what she was talking about was just in breathing as we inhale, reciting a word of scripture, a word of faith, and then another word as we exhale, and just repeating that. And as I left that group that day, it suddenly, this scripture I read this morning intersected with that. And I thought about Jesus breathing on the disciples. 
And I thought, we're afraid of breath. And yet here, the scriptures is telling us that Jesus breathes life into us. And I understood what this person was saying about the breath prayer, that in the midst of that airborne, that airborne virus that threatened us in breath, yet in the breath of Jesus we find life. And I began to practice that breath prayer in my own life. It, it could be in my car when I was coming here. It could be when I was walking. It could be any time of the day in my morning devotions, the breath prayer. And for me, it was breath of life, breathe on me. Breath of life, breathe on me. Would, would you just do that with me? Say that with me, would you? It's, it's just breathe normally, but say it with me. Breath of life, breathe on me. Again, breath of life, breathe on me. It's so life-giving. And as I thought about that scripture, it seemed like it filled my very being and how even in the midst of our lockdown, Jesus' breath gave us life. Locked doors. When John describes the house, the doors, and the locks, he's speaking about more than the physical house with walls, doors, hinges, and deadbolts. The locked places of our lives are always more about what is going on inside of us. What are the closed places of our lives? What keeps us in the tombs? Maybe it's a question of disbelief or the conditions we place on our faith. Perhaps it is sorrow and loss. Maybe the wounds are so deep that it does not seem worth stepping outside. For others, it may be anger or resentment. But for the disciples, in their fear, the doors are locked, but Jesus appears inside. He says, peace be with you. But he doesn't just end there. Listen carefully. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus, who is risen, as Jack prayed in his prayer, Jesus, who is risen, comes to us now in a locked down world. Still, even though COVID is over, in many ways, it's a locked down world. Even our computers have security with multiple walls and antivirus. It's symbolic of our time. But the risen Jesus isn't confined by space, time, walls, locks, for he is the help of all who seek him, the help of all who find. I enjoy the privilege of pastoral ministry around the Otterbein campus, whether it be in TCU, healthcare, patio homes or apartments, or seeing someone in a hospital. First of all, I, I enjoy learning about your story, who you are and where you have been. But there is something else too. I want to see where God has been revealed in your life. And often in the telling of your story, he is made visible. You know, in fact, the telling of our story is a part of our work as we age that is called life review. You know, most of us are retired from the work we've done throughout our lives, but now it's the inner work 
that becomes so important. And in that life review and looking back so many times, God is visible where we hadn't seen him at the time. It's a wonderful revel revelation and I love being there with people. When looking back, that aha moment comes, God was there. I see it now. He was always there in your story and I, I love to learn about that and to celebrate that. How God was in your story and how in the telling of it, in that life review, he becomes visible. Life review, we're all doing it. In one way or another, we're all doing that life review. Jesus has made a choice. He has chosen his way to become visible in the world. It was through his disciples, it's through us. So as you begin a new week, as you begin a new week, I'm not gonna call it homework, it's your adventure. I want you to be attentive to how God is calling calling you to make him visible. Maybe his call comes in the form of a gentle nudge or the name of someone that keeps coming back into your mind over and over to the door that beckons you to knock, to the pool or draw to say a word or to see someone down the hall or the mailbox across the way and to offer affirmation or encouragement. To pick up the phone and dial a number. Well, that shows my age, doesn't it? Dial a number. <laughs> to write a note. Well, that, that's old fashioned too. It's well, send a text or email. You get the idea. And one thing I am sure of through all of my experience and what the scriptures say, that whenever I arrive, the Lord is already there. And in some cases, he's already having a conversation. Blessed be that God is inviting us to help him become visible in the world around us. Blessed be the Lord.
And now may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you both now and forevermore. Amen.